my faithful Hurley Burley. It's, it's an historic day here on the Hurley Burley. Our first podcast after the CFL's long awaited return to play and my riders' beatdown of the BC Lions. First quarter was something. It's also the first episode in which we officially decouple the Hurley Burley interview podcast from the Hurley Burley political panel. Why? Because the political panel, with me, Jenny Byrne, and Scott Reed, now has its own show. It's called Curse of Politics. Get subscribed wherever you listen to your podcasts, and you can find it in your inbox every Tuesday. But like my heart, the Hurley Burley interview podcast will go on. We'll be dropping a new episode every week. And for you laggards, we'll still tack on the Curse of Politics political panel to the end of the Hurley Burley for the first couple of weeks, just until you formed a new disgusting habit. All right, today it's the Hurley Burley, and we've got a beauty lined up for you. It's our first ever three-headed NDP election panel, a basic primer on all the opportunities and threats Jagmeet and Team Orange have in front of them heading into the federal election. Joining me, we have a good friend of the show, Chris Ball. Chris is a longtime NDP campaign and communication strategist and a trusted advisor to business and political leaders in this country. Jordan Leitnitz makes her triumphant return to the Hurley Burley after only four weeks. Jordan is a Canada program officer for the Friedrich Ebert Stiff Tongue Office in Washington, a social democratic institute. Before that, she worked in senior roles for the New Democratic Party of Canada, including Deputy Chief of Staff. And we have Sally Hauser making her debut on the pod. Sally is a former advisor to NDP leaders Jack Layton and Rachel Notley, and until last Friday, Interim Chief of Staff to Ryan Miley, Saskatchewan NDP leader. Chris, Jordan, Sally, thank you all for coming on the Hurley Burley today. Great to have you. Thanks, David. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. How is everybody? Couldn't complain. Yeah, Sally, you're well. in Regina. You could complain. <laughs> Sally, you're in Regina. If you wanted to, you could complain. Oh, but nobody would listen anyways. Uh, it, looks, <laughs> it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day here on the prairies. Had a bit of rain last night. That's a, a really exciting thing for everybody involved. Uh, so despite the, uh, the early start, uh, for me, on the, the early, hurly start, um, I am actually in a great mood this morning. Excellent. Were you at the football game? I was not. I was in, actually in Vancouver, um, but I would have been otherwise. Uh, my, my husband and, uh, and kids were there, and uh, it, by all accounts, seemed like uh, a really good time was had by all. Excellent. Jordan, are you as excited about the start of the CFL season as I am? Oh, I doubt it very much. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it is good that you are excited because uh, I, I think that, you know, one federal election watching is probably not enough. We're, we're a little, you know, attention starved during the pandemic. So <laughs> Exactly. It's great. To we, all need, we all need stuff to get excited about. A little bit of a diversion. Chris Ball, I don't know if you two people know, but Chris Ball has a business on the side. I don't know if Ernst Cliff knows this either, but Chris Ball has a business on this side where he is um, making food, gourmet food, and selling it out of his home. Well, not out of my right, home, because that would that oh. would be out of tune with the good friends at Toronto Public Health. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I we give John Tory no respect on John Tory gets no respect on this pod for some reason. I don't know why it is, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so yes, I do. I, I, I have a little website, chrisballfood.com, and uh, from time to time, I'll pop out of nowhere, rent some commercial kitchen space, do a bunch of uh, food. Usually, it's been ribs and stuff, a good old down home barbecue. Um, but probably branching out in the fall. And yes, my employer is well aware. Because um, <laughs> I was like, you know, I kind of need to keep the job to have the other thing happen otherwise. Because I'm not sure if you know, the service industry right now, not a multi-million dollar industry right now. So it's having right. a tough time. Yeah. doesn't sound to me like people are leaving consulting jobs to go into food service not right. yet. I'm happy to be at the Vanguard, though. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get cracking. Uh, seems obvious that there's an election extremely imminent. Uh, many people expected it last weekend, certainly expected by Sunday to be called. So let's get into that mindset. 
And I want to start by asking you, and I know all three of you, um, a little bit at least. And so I know that you're not New Democrats because your parents were or because that's who your friends in university were. I know that you are New Democrats because you're genuine intellectual uh, social Democrats. Um, so with that backdrop, what is your opinion of the Trudeau government? Somebody just grab the mic and run with it. Tell me what you think. Oh, I, 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 can, I can start in on this one. Uh, I mean, all, all right, go ahead. Like, um, I, I think kind of going into this election, I, I, I said this to a friend yesterday, and I'll probably say it a lot over the course of the election, is that I think about the liberals and I know, you know, for all maybe the, the Gen Z listeners uh, you have or anything that this, you know, analogy might be a little bit out of date. Um, but I think about the liberals as like, Lucy and the Peanuts comics of just constantly having that football waiting for Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown being the voting public of Canada and just whipping it away from them. Um, of all the promises we've had over the courses of, year, of the years, like childcare being promised since I was a child myself, and in boil water advisories, any of the, the, you know, the last election in 2015, it will be the first past the post. Um, you know, pharmacare and everything like that. And it's um, the constant whipping away of the football of the campaign on the left, the govern on the right. Us as New Democrats have been, um, you know, fighting against that challenge the whole way through. I kind of love uh, working on the prairies in politics um, where the liberals are a lot less of a factor um, than, uh, than federally and in other parts of, of the country. But it's that, uh, it's that shell game, it's that bait and switch uh, of a government that really characterizes them to me. Um, and I think that'll be uh, one of the challenges uh, frankly, for the NDP of that kind of, you know, sometimes we feel like we're beating our head against the wall. Like, don't, don't you see that this is the same thing again and again and again, that they're going to promise the moon and deliver none of it. Um, and really being able to make that relevant and resonate uh, with folks across the country of like, don't, you know, don't be sold a false bill of goods again, right? If you want a progressive choice, actually vote for it. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Lucy with the football, that's how I would characterize the Trudeau government to me. Chris, what do you think about Trudeau's government? So I think that there's a bit of uh, exhaustion in the land around um, the, the, the highly staged managed uh, part of this government. Uh, so a friend of mine is talking to Caselli and I talk to friends and they give us really smart things to say. Um, so I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who kind of made the analogy between Jigmeet and uh, Trudeau is that the Trudeau government's the Instagram government where it's very perfectly manicured. Like it's, it's you know, the selfie on the, on the million dollar yacht. But if you look behind, it's actually like docked in like Toronto Harbor and it like there's really nothing there. Seagulls all over the place and whatnot. Right. And so uh, whereas, you know, Jigmeet is is more of the sort of TikTok guy, which is a lot more on the authenticity. You can believe what he says. There's less production value to it. It's not all a big fancy show. There's a general, general, con uh, a genuine connection to values. There's a genuine connection to outcomes, and this isn't just about you know uh, a short-term outcome with with let's collect as many people to be able to make sure that they all vote for us. This is about let's collect as many people to make sure that we are doing as much for as many people as possible, right? So it's there's a bit of a, a time horizon difference, I think. And I think that people are getting a little tired of, again, like the overly staged managed, the breathless announcements, the pronouncements on values, but still seeing no action on so many very, very, very important things. So Instagram versus TikTok seems to be also a, a bit of an apt analogy for the differences between Jagmeet and the Prime Minister. So Jordan, I'm going to make you a bad cleanup on this one. And I hear both of those critiques um, that Sally and Chris put forward. Um, but there's still boil water advisories in Canada, but there's fewer of them than there were in 2015. Um, and um, child care is happening. Um, 
And uh, I mean, this um, this government is reasonably, and I know that people are getting tired of the virtue signaling, but they are nonetheless. The government has apparently its heart in the right place on things like reconciliation, etc. What is the core from the left critique of the government? Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, David, I think I'd take you up on your invite to, to philosophize a bit as a social democrat, so you can all forgive me in advance. But, you know, I really fundamentally, I think that the issue is that while the liberals may have their hearts in the right place, they've got vested interests with corporate Canada that just mean that they're never going to be able to deliver the systemic change that's needed on a lot of these files, right? And, you know, I don't think you're going to find many new Democrats who will argue with you that a liberal government is worse than a conservative government. But you're certainly not going to find people who are excited um, about the, the amount of energy and scope of change that's really needed. So, you know, I think the childcare is a great example. You know, we're obviously, it's great to see progress on that. Um, this has been a, a commitment for 27 years, though. So the skepticism, I think, is quite warranted. And, and I believe we're probably looking at a, another deathbed conversion here on the part of the liberal. You know, if you latent people bring that up with me one more time, Jordan, I'm going to have to push back. I'm going to have well, to. I don't want ways. to, but I'm going to have to. We, we were all experienced on that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's the facts. <laughs> You know, and, and David, the other thing I would just say is that what really strikes me when I look back at, at this last this last term, you know, sort of post-2019 for, for Trudeau specifically, is that if you remove COVID, like in the absence of COVID, what was this government going to be about, really, right? What, what was animating uh, his desire to seek that office again? And I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that, there's really a compelling story to be told there, you know? Um, and that's interesting food for thought. He's been given a narrative because of the pandemic, but I don't think, you know, he was not coming in with a big, um, a big driving vision about how to fundamentally realign things here in Canada. And the reality is we're facing big problems. And so we do need some big changes. Interesting. Okay. So on the eve of this election, are you excited about it? And I mean, I, from my vantage point, it looks like the party is in much better shape for this election than it was for the 2019 election. Um, it looks like as an organization, it's more together. The leader um, is much more assured, I think, uh, than he was in 2019. And the polling situation is much better than it was in 2019. I actually thought going into 2019 that there might be some existential battle with the Green Party between the NDP, but that appears to have been vanquished. I read, I read today that they're laying off the remainder of their staff because they're spending all of their money on litigation internally. Um, so um, that's the last we'll mention of the Greens. So from my vantage point, the NDP are in a um, relatively strong position heading into this campaign. Are you excited about the prospects? I'm super jazzed about it, uh, and I am particularly from where I am on the prairies. And I, I think this is going to be uh, an interesting election. And so much, uh, I, I worked on uh, a, a COVID election uh, in Saskatchewan uh, back in October. Uh, and despite us kind of now starting to, to come out, um, or hopefully come out of the pandemic, um, you know, it, it is still kind of a pandemic election. And, and frankly, we don't know over the course of six weeks, whatever it is, how that's going to look. Uh, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of risk to it. it there's a, there's a lot of gamble to it. Um, I'm, I, I'm kind of almost shocked that they didn't go earlier this week. Cause if I was them, I'd want to get in and out to the polls before we see a fall spike where, you know, in, in Saskatchewan, um, we kind of did the did the election in the eye of the storm, where it was after a summer when people had kind of felt pretty good, and that benefited the government. Uh, and then basically, as soon as the election was over, things went through the roof, and it, you know, and, and it and it got real bad. So I mean, just just that of the kind of the 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 chaotic context of of, of kind of setting the table. Um, but in that context of a bit of chaos and a bit of gambling and a bit of um, not being sure what's going to uh, go, that can make an election really exciting. Um, you have, uh, you know, all these kind of possibilities. And then when I'm here on the prairies, 
uh, you know, the, the conservative stronghold in, in Saskatchewan, the, the conservatives had a clean sweep last time around. Um, you know, obviously Alberta is kind of changing with Notley and, and then Kenny doing poorly. You got uh, Manitoba, Pallister um, kind of not doing great. Uh, and so you have all these kind of conservatives premiers fighting against the government. Um, but yet Trudeau is extraordinarily unpopular here. But so is Aaron O'Toole. He's just like his his numbers in in places like, you know, southern Alberta, which should be an absolute no brainer, um, are not there. And in some polls, you have Jagmeet Singh ahead of not just Justin Trudeau, but also Aaron O'Toole as preferred prime minister in Saskatchewan, in Alberta, which is wild to me. And obviously the preferred prime minister doesn't necessarily always translate into seats, but that is uh, really interesting indicators uh, to me. And, and some of the numbers we're seeing federally, um, just in general polling, <clears throat> not even about the leader on the prairies are like we haven't seen um, in, in kind of 20 years here which is, it's, it's fascinating. So there's all sorts of, I, I think this has the potential uh, to be, uh, a, have a lot of kind of shockers and upsets as an election. I agree, but probably not in Saskatchewan, unfortunately. Saskatchewan now the most conservative place in Canada by a mile. <clears throat> but I mean, you've got three seats here, just in Saskatchewan, and that's where I am, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about other provinces or whatever. Uh, but uh, Regina Leuven, which is a conservative NDP switch seat, uh, Saskatoon West, same thing. And then uh, uh, Desnethy Miss Nippy Churchill in the north, which is always a toss up. That's been in 25 years. It's about the candidate. That yeah. writing's about the candidate. You know, it, it's, you know it's been a conservative, liberal, and uh, NDP twice each in the past 25 years. Um, and again, this is where. O'Toole's own numbers being real down and these, you know, the seats I mentioned are always real close. And then you've got the extra factor. And this is like Saskatchewan is actually kind of the province, probably Alberta a bit as well, where like the Maverick party, the people's party of Canada, yeah, they're, they're not winning a seat anywhere, but that 1%, 2%, 3% that they might garner makes a lot of a difference in those really close seats. And I know for, you know, your listeners that are, might be more kind of Ontario based and, and, uh, or, or Quebec or Eastern based, um, the idea of kind of new Democrat conservative switchers seems a bit foreign, but it's a real thing, uh, on the prairies. Um, I, you know, uh, I sometimes refer to Hamilton. Kind of, yeah. You know, and, and, and that, Exactly. Right. So there's all over the place where it's really like uh, an anti elitism, uh, an anti government. I, I sometimes refer to kind of voters or the, the sons of bitches voters, like throw the sons of bitches out. Uh, and I think that you're you're getting that. And, you know, Aaron O'Toole should be able to capitalize on that. But he's just not. It's just not happening. How many of you were able to visit virtually with your doctor during COVID? How about see the results of a medical test? or just get the treatment you or a family member needed. I'm betting it's a lot of you. Of all the ways the pandemic changed our lives, the way we access healthcare, and I'm really talking about digital health resources here, has been among the most significant. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, has been leading that effort. As Canada's largest and frankly most important IT healthcare provider, TELUS Health has been investing and innovating in this area for 13 years now. This expansion stemmed directly from CEO Darren Entwistle's foresight in creating a company with a strong social purpose, something TELUS had been focused on long before the pandemic. Their mission is clear, to help transform the way Canadians experience healthcare so that everyone, no matter their socioeconomic background, has equal access to it. And when TELUS says everyone, they mean everyone, urban and rural Canadians alike. The roadmap to get this done is 5G technology. The faster we open up Spectrum and implement 5G with all of its blazing speed means that all Canadians, especially those living in rural and remote communities where connectivity has been a challenge, can get on their screens, visit with their doctors, 
download large files of medical imagery and get the diagnosis and treatment they need. The result is simple, better care. It's going to help kickstart our post-COVID economic recovery too. 5G technology, as applied to healthcare in Canada, will generate an additional $16 billion in GDP value over the next 20 years. TELUS is committed to working with governments at every level to get this done. And you can learn more at telus.com slash health. Chris, what does a win feel like to you? Um, at the On election night, what does a win feel like? Is it 50 seats? Uh, is it uh, holding the Liberals to a minority? Um, what is a win? Well, a win is having Jigmeet Singh be Prime Minister of Canada. I mean, that's... That's a that is one okay. spectrum of win. Um, the right. other spectrum of win is yeah, uh, more consistent growth in seats. I think picking up seats in areas that we have been competitive but not yet maybe pushed us over the finish line. I'm looking at you know Mississauga, Brampton, those areas that should be closer to where like. We didn't do so well in those areas in 2019. If we can push some of those seats into our column, I think that's a win. Um, if we were able to establish a bit more of a beachhead in downtown Toronto, sorry, selfish, center of Toronto, center of the world guy here. Um, <laughs> like seats like Davenport that we only you, lost. You may be on your own, Chris. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Welcome to my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what, like that seats where we like we lost by like twelve hundred votes. Like Davenport was particularly painful. So seeing that momentum, I, I actually look at this as uh, the next step in a broader project. Frankly, right. So at the end of the day, first election in twenty nineteen, we ran with like what ten point nine million dollars. Now we're running a fully a fully funded twenty four twenty five million dollar campaign. We see our leaders positives through the roof. Uh, Sally did a great job of, you know, articulating what's happening in the prairies and in Western Canada, which is some movement we haven't seen in a while. BC is going to be particularly interesting, especially with the absolute shit show that the Greens have walked themselves into. Uh, the self-immolation is just incredible. Like if you want, if you want to stop a forest fire, you should probably start with the Green Party. Um, so <laughs> if you look at like what's happening there, right. So that, and, and with coupled with O'Toole's, you know, lukewarm, uh, reception that opens up a lot of possibilities in like rural BC, the greens collapsing opens up some more possibilities in Vancouver Island. Like I just also the general like mood of the land, like the things that we're talking about right now, aren't the, aren't the things that particular, that are traditionally things that suppress NDP votes. So we're not talking about deficit slaying and tax cuts and all these things that are typical things that people use to say, don't talk to those guys because they're going <laughs> to screw the deficit. So I think a win is uh, definite growth. I think, uh, you know, 50, 55, 60 seats, like hell, that's a hell of a job done. Right. So uh, I think the real win is for Canadians at the end of the day. Right. I mean, the major message you're going to hear in this campaign, I think it's right, is that if you send more new Democrats to Ottawa, you will get things done, right? And I think that is the biggest win of all, is that time after time we've seen, as we've articulated already, these guys just tend to talk and don't actually do much, and we're promising a lot more action and a lot less this. And for the listeners, because this is a podcast, I remember I just made the yappy yap noise of motion with my hand. <laughs> just so you know. Anyway. Oh. Uh, Jordan, uh, is the fundamental critique of the government and the vulnerability of the government politically to the NDP, is it that they say they'll do things and then don't do them? Or is it that they don't want to do the right things? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's both, right? There's, you know, there are, uh, I know well-meaning liberals and who, you know, who really who believe in this stuff, right? And <laughs> I might even be talking to one right now. <laughs> you know, not and, familiar. And, not familiar. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, these people are there for sure, and and you know, I think that. Um, but I do think that there is a, a high level of cynicism among voters when this becomes a repeated pattern, right? So that's a weakness. That's a vulnerability. But why it's particularly toxic for this government is because of the way that hope for major change was tied to Trudeau's personal brand. So. When, when that becomes decoupled, as it has over the last few years, uh, his own personal brand is weakened really dramatically. And what I'm most excited about in this campaign 
is, I mean, I really see this, um, this potential moment brewing for New Democrats where you've got opportunity meeting preparation. And it feels to me a little bit, a little maybe 2011-esque, you know, and I was lucky enough to serve with Jack on tour in that campaign. And I'll never forget, you know, uh, people forget, of course, but at the start of that campaign, like it was brutal, right? Like the coverage was terrible. We were going out to these events and, you know, we were getting crowds of like five and 600 in these small communities and the coverage was just garbage. But what was what was actually happening on the ground, there was a reflection of the energy and the popularity that Jack had that was that was coming from the that was bubbling a bit from the bottom up. Um, and we did see that come to fruition during the campaign and the campaign had uh, its decks in order and was able to close the deal on that. So right now I look at, you know, a, a much more fully funded campaign. Uh, I look at a leader with personal popularity going through the roof. Um, and these things are coming together in a way that I think could be really, really pretty magical for the team. Yeah, I remember in 2011, okay, just, about, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry, just, I would like to, to no, back go ahead, up Sally, on, yeah. to back to up on this. Yeah, in 2011, I had every journalist in Ottawa telling me that we were going to lose seats, yep. that like we were going to get kind of stomped and that the, the, the Greens were going to eat our lunch, that uh, all of this. And um, I mean, I love the revisionist history and no disrespect to my friends uh, in the media in Ottawa, but like they didn't like Jack until like, you know, two weeks after he died, basically, right? Like even, and even after that great growth in 2011, um, it was, you know, oh my God, buyer's remorse, all, all this kind of, all this kind of stuff. And I, you know, people talking about, well, you know, Jagmeet is, you know, Tom Mulcair was no Jack Layton or Jagmeet is no Jack Layton. I'm like, you guys, like, I'll, I'll show you the articles. You, you, you were writing, like, do you not? Do you not remember this? Anyways, that's that's an aside and a personal point <laughs> of bitterness. I <laughs> no, I no, suppose. it's I, you know, but it's but it, but to Jordan's par, uh, point, I think you're looking at Trudeau, who's been prime minister, and it's hard to you know of that kind of hopey changey when you've been prime minister. It's hard to get, kind of get people excited and that newness and everything else like that. Um, Aaron O'Toole just doesn't have that at all. When we're looking at the campaign, the only leader with any form of like people, like new, young, excited, the only leader that really has that is Jack Me. Okay, so let's talk about him for a second. So I had him on this show, and I really liked him. Um, I thought he, I thought he was, uh, I thought he was very impressive, and he was certainly extremely engaging. He was very, very difficult not to like. Uh, personally, my question is: My question is this: um, He has um, extraordinary support among people under the age of thirty-five, like unusual, like not just better than the other two leaders, but unusual for a leader of any stripe to have in terms of favorables among people under the age of thirty-five. Um, and he has extremely weak favorables. Uh, among people over the age of 55. So this leads me to two questions about, three questions about him, one of which is what causes that divergence in appeal? The second thing is, will the kids come out to vote? And the third thing is, what can you do to make him more attractive or more reasonable prospect to older Canadians? Who I think probably, the, the communication style that he has is unique. And I think my hypothesis would be that to young people, they find it authentic and cutting through all the bullshit of politics. And I think to older people, it feels a little bit light. Um, so that's my preamble. Somebody run with it. Tell me about Jagmeet Singh. Um, Sorry, guys, all again as a Newfoundlander, and I, I feel it difficult to let any any space for conversation uh, go without without filling it. So I often it find myself just like having a beer with you, Sally. <laughs> 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 I often find myself as the first one uh, jumping in. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, and, and I'll say it straight up that that kind of uh, divergence between older voters and younger voters, it's a level of racism in it um, across the country. And, you know, I, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, and recognize it. Um, 
and I think how you address that um, is again with that excitement I'm t- I'm talking about. And so you've got kind of the your grandkids or your kids or whatever, and you're not maybe super engaged in the election or politics or anything. And then you've got somebody you know in your family, or you kind of hang around your house or you're having dinner with, and somebody who has a genuine excitement and 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 feeling of like, and this is and actually this this and this and all you're you're older well um you know uh long-term care people have been dropping like flies over the course of the pandemic and before because things are terrible um or um you know you're on your fixed income and don't have any money because you're having to choose between rent and buying your meds um well you know pharmacare Right. And all like that kind of both excitement and actually and, and, and being able to kind of talk face to face with it's always that like you don't trust somebody like I, I, I get what you're saying in that like it doesn't seem it seem I, I think probably for an older crowd, an older generation, um, perhaps seems a little slick to them. But then when you talk to somebody in your own world, in your own universe, in your own family, um, who's uh, genuinely excited And then also able to say, and you're not hearing it from the news and you're not hearing it from a a press release or a a media availability or whatever, talking about these quite, you know, very specific issues that you yourself as as an older person care about, uh, that that's how that that changes. But like, you know, excitement is infectious, uh, essentially. And I think that that's something that the NDP is really going to be looking to to capitalize on. Yeah, I think there's like this tranche of like the just disbelief uh, that he can win. And part of that is the racism they think Sally is spot on on pointing out. Right. And the fact that, well, somebody looks like Chick Me can't win is probably back of mind, maybe not showing up in polling because that's not something people want to admit to a random pollster. Right. Um, and so creating that sense of like. Uh, that sense of enthusiasm, that sense of a bit of a momentum piece happening, I think helps jog some of that free, right? To say, oh, no, wait, like I'm validated by the people around me that that somebody with Jigmeet's ideals, somebody with Jigmeet's presence in these movements like BLM, uh, that he actually is a legitimate force uh, for change in the country. I think that helps move some of that forward. Um, I think also like uh, particularly... <sighs> A lot of folks in the sort of older demographic have been so attuned to these very transactional campaigns, right, around like, okay, so we're going to do these three things for you, sorry, three things for you, and you got to vote for us, otherwise you're not going to get these three things, right? And I think that Meets are really kind of, and the team are trying to attack it in a bit of a different uh, way. It's a much more of a relational campaign. It's a lot more of an emotional campaign. It's a lot more of an activist style, deeper connection. Let's cut through the bullshit, as you said, and let's get shit done. Because a lot of these moments that we've had over the last, you know, little while, like with uh, the murder of George Floyd, have come to these like huge emotional crescendos, and then nothing's happened. And where Jagmeet and the team tend to take this rest of the spaces, well, fuck it, we're tired of just talk, 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 because that's what's got us here. Let's fucking make it happen. And that's sometimes shocking to people, and that's sometimes like unsettling for people. As far as the Utes go, um, I think you know, there are, there is a ton of opportunity there. And I think the team is being very smart in how they're organizing the campaign to capture some of that. Let's not forget, you know, 2019 was apparently the election where millennials were the biggest electoral cohort. And they came out for us in very, uh, in very tactical ways. And very, in, so there's this huge rally in Victoria that happened in 2019 towards the end. Just of the a context that, for what you're talking about, Chris, the context for, and, and the question about will the kids turn out just for listeners is, Probably one supporter over the age of 55 is in ballot box terms worth two under the age of 35. Ballpark, roughly, in terms yeah. of turnout factor. Normally, in a normal election. Not always true. Right. Right? Totally. Yes. I, I'm, there's no disagreement about that on my end. So what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get mm-hmm. to, and I guess that's my signal that Chris, you're fucking rambling here, is that <laughs> at the end of the day, like... 
the the 18 to 24s are highly tied to him because of his authentic communication style. The team is investing in the tools and playing in the spaces that actually help uh, drive that emotional connection. That emotional connection then converts to ballot box, right? And so it's a much different way of campaigning. Like, for example, they've set up a, a digital organizing team called Team Jigmeet on Facebook, right? And it's basically digital Gen Z organizers who are, you know, doing friend banks. So calling their five friends to be able to say, hey, listen, uh, this guy's important to me. Here are the reasons why he's important to me. So from a just a, a straight up tactical perspective with $25 million in the bank and smarter and smarter tactics around actually reaching this cohort that thinks differently about elections, uh, I think you're going to see a lot more turnout from that cohort than we've seen in the past. Yeah, I mean, I would just add, I think what Sally brought up in terms of younger people being very persuasive within their family and networks to those older voters is huge. Like, this is very significant. And I think what we're going to see this campaign is, uh, frankly, what New Democrats are already doing, which is is actually actively kind of mobilizing that through these digital tools, through distributed organizing. I mean, the, the organizers who are responsible for this stuff have paid a lot of attention to what worked in BC, to what worked in US campaigns. Like I think about campaigns like Senator Ed Murkey's, you know, like where they did really kind of cutting edge distributed campaigning stuff. And so that all those lessons have been taken in and they're really going to be hitting the ground running with that. And so you can think of these younger voters, not just as ballot box voters for themselves, but also as, as like messengers within their, within their circles and their networks for that, uh, you know, for that vote. But, and the other thing I would say about older voters is that I think that, you know, campaigns really truly do matter, particularly for this cohort. Uh, they will be able to see Jigmeet in more traditional spaces, like on the debate stage, um, more regularly in the nightly news during the campaign period than they have over the last two years. And that's going to make a difference. I mean, I think last time we can all agree that, he went into the debates, for example, with pretty low expectations and performed very well. So I think that there's opportunity there for people to be to be impressed and engaged. And if already they're getting some of those messages from the younger people in their lives, that may be enough to shift that. So, also, I mean, in my, if we, as I recall, the last as I recall, the debate. Go ahead, Chris. As you Go say, ahead. if you want to drive youth turnout, maybe don't call elections when the universities are shut and university students don't have the ability to vote on campus like they usually do. Sorry, just had to get that shot in. Go ahead, David. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that the liberals are trying to goose the 18 to 24 turnout. Um, <laughs> it's so, quite clear. Uh, you, you all blew past. You all blew past my assertion, and you may have just been polite to me, or maybe that you don't want to address it. Does Singh have a gravitas problem? I, th no, I, I think, you know, I think, I don't think so. No, I think at the end of the day, again, this is like, so if you talk to, if you talk to an 1824 year old, even somebody in the 32, 35 year olds, like that is not a problem that comes up. People see him as grounded in the movements and grounded in the things that they care about. Right. So calling it a gravitas problem is, is basically saying, is he not campaigning like every other person has campaigned since blah, blah, blah. Cause there's these traditional forms of like, gray haired old dudes being like, yes, I think this is very important. And that isn't him. So I don't think that that necessarily means like being the gray haired old dude that's trying to wag your finger and be all authoritative about shit on a campaign doesn't mean like that doesn't cut that doesn't cut through like it used to anymore. Right. So what cuts through now, what the, where the real gravitas is, is being present in moments that matter and being present in movements that matter and being present and talking about values and, and connecting those values to action. That's the new gravitas. That action and that connecting those values to getting things done is the new gravitas. Because gravitas is an intellectual powdered wig bullshit thing, right? Like it's a <laughs> construction. It's not like, it's not a fucking like, it's not, oh, like, oh, I get, he's got gravitas. Like it is, it is a construction by, I think the media and it's a mental frame that people have that is going to keep getting busted year after year as a new generation of leaders come up through the ranks. Does that address your particular, <laughs> your particular question, David? I think it does. It does. I, th I think it's when we talk about who has a, a gravitas uh, problem, I think it's uh, Aaron O'Toole. 
I think he's the guy who that's as conservatives. Want. Oh, is that his problem? I was wondering I mean, what his got, problem was. I mean, you know, we could go on about his problems for some time, uh, frankly. But uh, but that uh, in terms of like, y- you know, you try to put a framework around a leader. And if you try to put a framework around a leader that doesn't fit, that isn't authentic or whatever, it never goes well. Um, but, you know, in terms of that, like, prime minister dad feeling that conservatives want and like and want to have from a conservative leader and a conservative government, that's not coming across, right? He's not getting that. Right. Uh, and that is, 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 I think, you know, is that his problem? I think it's one of the more fundamental ones, right? And it's not going to uh, get... Well, it's an issue. I'd like to hear you guys talk about this. I'd like to hear you folks talk about this a little bit because I'm, I'm, I'm mystified by it, to be honest. I'm mystified by the weakness of the conservatives. I understand that this is not necessarily a time for conservatives to win. I think the balance of the population are center left right now and looking to be progressive, but that's a reason why they can only get 35% of the vote. That's not a reason why they're getting 25% of the vote. And, and saying, uh, sorry, uh, O'Toole, regardless of what you think of him, nobody knows who he is. Let's be honest about that. You could walk up and down the streets of Regina or any other town and nobody will know anything about him. So it's not like people have made an informed judgment that he's bad, but they have decided that he's bad. So what's going on? I think his team committed the cardinal sin, right? Like it's, they, they violated authenticity. He is not running as who he is. He's trying on different personas. You know, he did through his leadership campaign. We've seen, we're seeing him cycle through some of those now and people, people understand that that's not, that's not real. They don't connect with it. Um, And it creates a huge opening for his opponents to characterize him, which, you know, the many, many months, uh, you know, the year since since the leadership, uh, that's exactly what's happened. So he, he created this situation uh, created the opportunity and then walked right into it. So he's got a big problem. And I think that, you know, the flip side of that coin, like Jagmeet's superpower is his authenticity, right? And just to go back to that question of gravitas for a moment, I think we need to ask what, you know, who who is being held to that standard, right? And I think back to when uh, prior to Justin Trudeau's leadership, you know, we uh, there were some questions about gravitas, but not many. And to be charitable, his his pre-prime ministership career in the House of Commons was modest, right? Uh, and and perhaps more notable for things like boxing with Brazo. And, you know, so th- those are, to me, uh, I think that that's, that's just really a form of gatekeeping, right? Uh, Jigmeet can go toe-to-toe on stage with uh, your average middle-aged white man politician anytime, and he will. <laughs> and I think we're going to look forward to seeing that. And, and hopefully a bit of a realignment around some of the respectability politics that is being used to keep women and people of color out. Interesting. I have a, uh, I have a, a oh, de- go ahead, Dave. Go ahead, Sally. No, you go uh, ahead. I was just, this is a little bit of a flight of fancy, but I often think to myself how in, in a kind of sliding doors type of way, would the political landscape of Canada be radically different if he'd lost, if Justin Trudeau had lost that boxing match to Brazo, if he'd just gotten <laughs> stumped. I, 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 I think about that more often than I should. Uh, anyways, that's Well, it's a, a perfect, it's a perfect aside. segue. No, but it's a perfect segue because there was so much serendipity involved in Trudeau becoming prime minister. Hugely. So much serendipity involved in it that it's a fair point. And it leads me indirectly, I guess, to something I'm, I hope you're not offended by this question. Uh, But I'm so interested in it. Uh, And everything about the premise may offend you, and I apologize for that. But I've been watching NDP campaigns since David Lewis was the leader. So for a long time. And every election, that entire period of my life, the NDP were not a... challenge to win the ele- to win federal elections and didn't really pretend that they were sometimes the rhetoric would lean more that way uh, and other times it would lean less that way depending on momentum going in but the reality was that voting NDP was not really a choice about government voting NDP was a statement of intent and belief 
and they they filled the party filled a role in Canadian politics that was something different than challenging for power, more like an influencer. And then for five years, that was different. And then from the period of two weeks left in the 2011 election to the end of the 2015 campaign, the party was a threat to win government. And I don't mean threat in a negative way. I mean, the party had the prospect of winning government. That the, <laughs> and, and that... Um, and that is a whole different mindset. And, and then it ended. And then it ended. And then you're seemingly back where the party always was before 2011 in that, in that role. Um, what has that, maybe talk both personally and objectively about what has that experience been like? Uh, you know, for, first of all, nobody else other than a Democrat could have been through that. But, uh, you know, first of all, your your premise of what might offend us is is the the the, the bar is pretty low. I was expecting something a little, <laughs> little more more out there, David. Um, you know, the ups and downs of it. Now, I've in terms of my work and my experience, my time with the NDP, the first campaign I ever worked was in 2009 in Nova Scotia when we formed government. And then uh, the second kind of major campaign I worked was in, in 2011, or didn't form government, but massive growth, right? And that, that potential forming, Jack Layton being prime minister was on the menu uh, towards the end, despite people starting at the campaign telling us we were gonna lose seats. But towards the end of it, that was very much on the menu. Um, you know, I worked for a government in, in Manitoba uh, and was lucky enough to be part of, uh, of Rachel Notley's uh, campaign in 2015. So kind of my experience as a new Democrat, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s now, um, has been, you know, more mixed than perhaps that history. And there's a whole generation of uh, not just new Democrats, but people who see whether provincially or have, you know, that experience kind of with, with Leighton in 2011, where that, that is a possibility that's on the menu. Um, and, and again, kind of with, uh, with a younger cohort, and, and when I say young, I'm not, you know, quite talking about Gen Z, but it's still partially because I, I, I'm the dividing line I'm of, of 1980, of, of Gen X and, and millennial. Um, d depending on the crowd, I'm, I'm, I can be one or the other, right? Um, but it, I'm going to, you know, uh, for, for the purposes of this conversation, still consider myself kind of young, basically. Um, but of that kind of... I can of, assure you that you are. Yeah, I can but, assure you that you are. But of that kind of basically, you know, the, the millennial and younger, being told um, that you can't win or this isn't the right thing for you or anything never works really well. Um, and, and as we've seen, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, no, you can't win, you can't win until you can and then you do. Right. And things I, I think the volatility of the, the kind of political spectrum now, not just in Canada, but, you know, kind of in the whole Western world of things are they are like they are. They are like they are until they're not and they get flipped on their head. Uh, and I think given, you know, the chaotic year, uh, going back to what I was first saying about kind of chaos and the potential of this uh, the election of people are worried and freaked out. Uh, now is part of the reason o O'Toole is not doing well is in addition to just him personally and his team, the situation of, man, things are getting real expensive. Uh, you're seeing inflation going up, uh, housing, all these, all these things, that feeling of security is not there in a way that it often is. Um, and, and I think that that benefits uh, the NDP because, okay, we're not seeing it out of Trudeau uh, and that kind of comfort that the conservatives often offer of like, don't worry again, that idea of prime minister dads here, we're gonna take care of it, you're gonna be okay, um, is also not there, 
right now. Uh, and I think, you know, that experience of the pandemic, people working minimum wage jobs, people working the front lines, people in the service industry, the idea of, uh, you know, being put in all this kind of danger and stuff uh, and may, still making minimum wage, not being able to afford a house uh, and not being able to, you know, basically have a living. That anxiety is rising. We're right in that kind of period right now. And, and I think that that's a real kind of collective. Um, and how I, you know, I can a hundred percent or, or 50% or maybe even 20%, uh, predict how that's going to affect the campaign. But I think that that rising anxiety and also recognition, uh, of the pandemic of really exposing that anxiety and those cracks in the society. I think that that is going to play a large part in this campaign. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think Jordan, what was that I, ride like for you? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that was my first major federal campaign and it is, t it is tough to top that. <laughs> um, I mean, it was, uh, you rarely get those moment, moments in politics where you can sort of see the magic unfolding. And, and certainly the 2011 campaign was, was absolutely one of those. And, you know, what I, what I remember most about that time and that tour and, and particularly that time with Jack was, he uh, he had really come to a point where he was so himself in in his uh, in his campaign style in his interaction with media he was having fun he was having just a lot of fun on that campaign even though it started I, I mean people forget but you know he had his broken hip and I remember we were we were so worried about whether we were going to really be able to get him mobile enough to to actually run a national tour. Um, and he did it and and he was having a blast. And that made really all the difference in terms of how, what the energy was like there. And and I think that by the end of it, you know, there was no way that you couldn't be a bit in awe of, of both his stamina and his dedication, but also of the results. You know, I'll never forget on the, on the day before E-Day, you know, we did whistle stops from, we started in Montreal, did whistle stops all the way down through to Toronto. And we pulled in, we pulled into Kingston and Kingston is, is a seat that's always, we always have our eye on it. Um, and it's been elusive for us. And, you know, it's not a, not a huge place. So you don't necessarily expect big, big crowds kind of midday and, you know, and whatnot. And we pulled in and we got a radio from the police that they'd had to close the street and we needed to pull around on a different block. And I'll never forget because I was, I was back with the journalists. We pulled around this block and the entire, uh, the entire block, the entire street around the campaign office was closed off and jam-packed. There had to be a thousand people there. The journalists were picking their jaws up off the floor. It was something, and this was in Kingston, you know. Uh, the, that was the moment, really, when you, you knew that, like, things were taking off. Something, something was really, really happening here. And I think that what, what I see, you know, I do see some commonalities between Jigmeet and Jack. And one of the biggest ones, maybe it's superficial, is that Jigmeet has a lot of fun with this. He likes campaigning. He's a genuine extrovert. He is somebody who delights in meeting people, really listens to their stories, takes that in. That's energy. That's fuel for him. Um, and he's very, very like Jack. He's like very clear about why he's doing this work. And I think that sometimes that's an underrated political virtue. And it's one that when you're in the crucible of a campaign can really get you through quite a lot. So I do think, you know, as part of the generation of new Democrats that was really formed by that 2011 campaign, I think that, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think we're fairly clear eyed about what that looks and feels like and about the necessity of not le like not letting go of that. Right. That is the goal here is to form government. The goal here is Prime Minister Jigmeet. Um, and it, it's sort of the job of the team around him to line up that preparation with the royal jelly that he brings as a leader personally to this. And I think we're starting to see that. I, I have an asshole question. I have a jerk question. It's maybe not full asshole. Again, well, like, I, you know, yeah. based on you're trying to offend us previously, we'll see how much of an asshole or jerk question it actually is, man. Well, let's see how let's see how well I, let's see how well I can do. All right, Steph and you all lost an election badly as leader of the Liberal Party, and ran in many respects a comically inept campaign. But Steph and you was a member of the Liberal family, and would be enthusiastically greeted at any Liberal convention anywhere, and people would be happy to see him, 
and happy to spend time with him. Um, Michael Ignatieff was a hired gun, and uh, I don't expect to ever see Michael Ignatieff at a liberal convention. Again, there's zero relationship between the Liberal Party and Michael Ignatieff. Where's, what is Tom Mulcair's status in the NDP? Um, I'm happy to take this one. Um, I've, uh, you know, worked with, with Tom, albeit less closely, uh, than, than other people did. Um, I think he would have been welcomed and greeted. Um, but the last election, um, you know, and, and media outlets delighted in having him on as a commentator, um, because he was super excited to just go and, and kick us. You might as well have had a conservative or a liberal on. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I personally don't Which have Which maybe any time. he is. Yeah, I personally don't have uh, any, any time for that, right? Um, so, I, and I think that that's a large part of it where people kind of, you know, was it the right thing to bounce him? And, you know, but still had a level of respect and, and, and everything like that. But I think for, I can't speak for every new Democrat, um, but I, I know that there's at least a certain segment of, uh, of the, the new Democrat family that feels, feels the same way I do. You just don't. Totally. Yeah. Like, I mean, like at the end of the day, like we're, we're also, we're not a part of the traditionally does the knives out thing very well, right. For leaders, at least, you know, where I'm, currently situated and in other places yes david you're leading in much to much to the much to the joy of andrea horvath is all i was going to say uh anyway uh <laughs> um, yeah, and so that's a whole other podcast that we, we can <laughs> um but i think there, there 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 is a transgression there i think at the end of the day like once you're sitting there and you're a paid media commentator throwing rocks at your old team. Like, why would the old team want you back? Right. Like if like to tortured baseball analogy, you trade your, 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 your star pitcher and he starts beaning your team the first game out. Like that guy's not getting invited to the like alumni brunch the next day. Right. So there's likely think, a lot of yeah, liberals like, who are finding that ironic on this podcast. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure they are. Um, but it's true though. I mean, at the end of the day, like you can't like they're they're we are we are a relatively welcoming and forgiving bunch, I would say, on a lot of things. Uh but uh on that, especially when you're sniping from the sidelines during your campaign, it's just like it's classless. No Come on, you must all yeah. have hated the twenty fifteen campaign. You must all have hated the twenty fifteen campaign. Uh hate is a strong word, David. Uh, it was a difficult, it was a difficult campaign, uh, a difficult campaign emotionally, I think as well, just sort of like coming in on that high and seeing the, like, you know, you walk in that room and it's, oh, Hey, we're at like 43% at some point, like in the campaign and people are starting to get really jazzed and there's a buzz. And then, you know, you start to kind of see it slip away and that gets difficult. And that last week I, I felt was very difficult, you know, seeing, you know, Tom in the rolled up sweater, you know, talking with the TPP and just seeming like seemingly completely miscast. Uh, it was a bit tough. Of course it was tough, but every party has tough campaigns. Every party has leaders that may, may not gel with uh, the party or may not gel with the electorate. And, you know, we've, we've since moved on and we've just spent this entire podcast talking about the next guy who was actually set up to probably have a bit of a breakthrough in this campaign, right? So it's kind of the continuum of politics, right? And so I know folks like to try to weigh us down with like baggage and, you know, pronouncements about how we're not fit to win or we don't think that we're going to win. And, you know, we do and we are, right? So I've got enough baggage. <laughs> I think the energy of these two, these, these two campaigns is completely different. Right. And, totally. and I, I feel that going in, but listen, like 2015 was a tough campaign. There's no new Democrat that's going to tell you otherwise, but the important thing is really, what did we take away from it? Were there lessons learned? There were huge lessons learned on a number of levels that, that frankly had nothing to do with Tom, but were at an organizational level. Uh, that I think are going to serve New Democrats really, really well. Um, and I don't, you know, I think, I think Tom's, you know, I, I worked with Tom very closely during his time as leader. Tom's a very smart guy. 
uh, he, he, cho- he has chosen to take those smarts um, and use them in commentary. And, and that's his decision, right? And, and I think, you know, he knows full well how that's received by most Democrats. And, but for him, that's, that's something that he, he sort of is valuing in his, his, his post-politics life. And ultimately, that's his decision. But I do think that, you know, we're not left with nothing from that experience. We did learn, we did learn a great deal, um, both in terms of, of should we find ourselves in a similar circumstance in future, uh, what to assume and what to not assume, um, how to manage long campaigns, what we could do better, um, and really making sure also that we're not answering the last, the last ballot question, right? And that we are making sure that we've got our leader set up to be the right person for the right moment. And, and I think that, you know, there's, in truth, you know, Tom gets a lot of flack and, and, and some of it is, you know, he has welcomed that and, and, and attracted that. But like most things that didn't go well, it's a team effort, right? And so I think we also, we do best when we, we look at the tea leaves of 2015 and actually take something constructive out of it beyond just the leadership question. All right. Okay. We're out of time, although I could do this all day. I am so enjoying this conversation, but we are out of time. So I want to ask you to sum all this up and tell me, in your mind, what's the fundamental wedge between the Liberals and the NDP? Um, I think uh, defending a record in governance, right? And this is the, the, the excitement that even the Liberals were able to do a little bit last time around, which of course was not very long ago, uh, election, but um, I think they're running out of runway on the trust us. I think trust is going to be that fundamental wedge. Uh, and you, we've talked a lot about authenticity uh, on this uh, on this podcast. Uh, and I think that that's what, but for the every, every leader in the campaign, but particularly uh, the liberals kind of living and dying on, or, or how many more times can they pull the football away? Um, and I think that that kind of that that trust and authenticity is so much part of Justin Trudeau's brand um, that if they cannot, if people are not buying what they're selling in that respect, um, they're going to be looking a lot more to the NDP in terms of that trust and authenticity. Jordan, what do you see as the yeah. wedge between the I, two? I think it's whose side are you on? This is it. You know, this is really uh, when when pushes come to shove here, are the liberals choosing to make decisions that are primarily protecting their friends? And can that be demonstrated? And does the public trust you, that Jugmeet is going to be making decisions that are in the interest of regular people? And I think he's coming into this campaign armed with a really great quiver full of proof on that. Everything from you know, getting the CERB doubled to extending the wage subsidy. Like these are big wins in a scenario where a lot of uh, liberals wanted to talk down his influence in this government. So he's going in, I think, well-equipped on that front. And I'm looking forward to watching him prosecute that case. Okay. Chris? I I wouldn't dare uh, be contrarian in the face of those two brilliant opinions. And I'm going to say that, I mean, I agree, right? Like it's trust and authenticity and who's going to get shit done for real people, Uh, especially as we sort of, we either enter into a scarier Delta variant wave or as we crest out of it into the future, right? There's some very important decisions that are going to get made and they actually have to get made and they actually have to benefit real working people. Uh, Otherwise the whole thing gets completely fucked. Awesome. Listen, thank you all very much. Chris, we didn't get to talk about the Blue Jays, but they're very exciting right now. And I know you must be very over the moon about them. I am over the moon and back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, all, it's all very exciting. And, you know, Sally, if we can just bottle that first quarter last week and keep it going, the riders will also be keep it going, in, man. in great shape. And, uh, Jordan, thank you for coming back on just four weeks after having done this show for the first time. I can't believe you did that. And <laughs> you <laughs> and need I'm the recovery grateful. time, I know. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it's really, it's, it's David's deeply offensive questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a year, Jordan. It's been a year since I was last on, and oh, I've really? only just got over it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to send them some brisket. You know? right. yeah, oh, really my God. That would, be, that would really work. 
thank the thank you all so so much. Have a great campaign. Have fun, and we'll check in with you from time to time. Take care. Thanks for coming Been on. Been a slice. Pleasure. Thanks, David. Pleasure. See ya. That was so great. I want to thank Jordan and Chris and Sally for having that conversation with me. The NDP are going to be a big factor in this election campaign. And uh, it was great to have them spell it out all for us. I want to thank you for listening and w- or watching, whichever you do. I want to thank our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. And I'd also like to thank the Air Quotes media team who puts this together and uh, Metal Donkers Good, the engineer of this program. And we'll be back with more Hurley Burleys next week. Take care. It's hot. This has been a ferocious summer, particularly out west. None of us has ever seen weather like this in Canada. In June, southern British Columbia experienced a high of just about 50 degrees Celsius. That's the average maximum summer temperature in the sand desert of Saudi Arabia, an area so pitiless it's called the empty quarter. The thing is, southern BC is not empty. It's filled with communities and First Nations through which our sponsor, CN Rail, operates trains all year long. The safety of those communities is CN's greatest priority. So it makes sense to have plans to prevent fire, particularly during periods of extreme weather. To begin with, CN tracks are filled with sensors and detectors that constantly scan cars and locomotives for hazards like overheated wheels, hot bearings, or dragging equipment. And CN's train and maintenance crews are effectively trained as first responders. They are not professional firefighters, but they have basic firefighting equipment and are instructed to remain at the scene of any fire they spot, containing it, if they can, until the professionals arrive. CN also maintains firefighting trailers at strategic points along its network, where heavier gear like pumps, hoses, and bladders are stored. During extreme weather, CN adjusts the speed of its trains. Locomotives are placed where cabooses used to be to enable forward monitoring. Extra patrols precede and follow trains, looking for any signs of fire crews may have missed. Steps are taken to remove any loose brush or debris on right-of-ways. And of course, mechanical inspections are intensified to ensure no locomotive is emitting sparks. CN's drive to be North America's safest railway continues. All right, current Hurley Burleyites, it's a big day. Welcome to the premiere episode of our brand new podcast, It's Curse of Politics, starring the Hurley Burley political panel. That's me and those crafters of brilliant campaign strategies and utterers of vivid expletives, Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Curse of Politics wherever you get your podcasts. When you do, you'll be able to boast to your friends. Have you got the curse? Why not? I've got the curse and it's goddamn great. I want to be really clear about this. The Hurley Burley Interview Podcast is still a show. We'll be dropping a new episode weekly. But here's the important thing to know about Curse of Politics. First of all, during the writ period, we will have a special on the day the writ is called. And then following that, we will be five days a week, every morning, in your inbox by 8 a.m. with both a news roundup, the latest overnight polling from Ecos Research, and Jenny, Scott, and my analysis of the campaign at that point. Don't miss Curse of Politics every day during the writ period. All right, we've got an election speculation show on tap for you today, chock full of all the rumors we've heard from all our friends in the highest and lowest places. Let's see, I'm not in the prediction business, but the writ's going to drop sometime in the next 48 to 144 hours. We'll talk about campaign (laughs) kickoffs and share some of our own war stories. Plus, it's a lonely existence on the Liberal backbenches. Amos is out, Vaughn is out, McCrimmon is out. We'll discuss those latest members of the Liberal class of 15 not running this time around. And if there's time, we'll even chat about why Jay-Z and Beyonce were on the Obama 60th birthday invitation list, and Jenny Byrne wasn't. And don't forget (laughs) to stick around for our Hey Yous to close out today's curse. Jenny, Scott, goddammit you two, it's our own show. How does it feel? Oh, it feels great. It's very exciting. <laughs> the curse of politics. I love it. It sounds like a universal horror film. We expect Lon Chaney Jr. to show up as Petian. <laughs> <laughs> I must get the vote. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Abbott and Costello, Meet the Monster was on the other night. The curse, uh, Meet Frankenstein was on the other night. And it was, you know, Lon Chaney Jr. turns to Bud Cost, uh, turn, turns to Lou Costello and says, but you don't understand. When the moon is full, I become a wolf. He's like, yeah, you and every other guy on shore leave. Fuck, I love Lou Costello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't beat a line like that. Hey, Scott. Yes, sir. Did you just celebrate your mother's birthday? I haven't. We haven't celebrated it. It just was. We're going to celebrate it on Saturday. So this is an appeal to uh, the prime minister. Please. Friday is not great, but OK. Sunday, better. Probably ideal. Saturday, don't. No, like a don't 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 rain on. <laughs> don't be raining on Judy's parade. We've got the cousins. We've got uh, <laughs> got all the old friends coming. Yeah. So my mother turned 75. She turned 75 last Sunday. We're going to have a party on uh, Saturday. Uh, she's opposed to all of it. She's opposed to aging. She's opposed to uh, recognizing her age and she's opposed to having people gather and uh, and, and speak with her. But we're going to make it all happen. Well, happy birthday to her. Yes, happy sure. birthday, Scott's mom. She will. She never listens to this. <laughs> she never listens to the pod. She's uh, no too much. Too much swearing. She doesn't. She was astonished to discover that I curse. So, <laughs> Jenny, after all the time you've spent away from Toronto, why are you in Toronto in the muggiest, most humid, awful time of the year to be in Toronto? Uh, well, I had to come back. Uh, work, work is busy and people are starting to meet more in person. Um, uh, and uh, it's a lot of, as, as we ramp up, as we ramp, I know, David, I'm sorry. And as we ramp up for the election, <laughs> there's just a lot of commentary and things to be done here. I'm also having my condo painted. So not only are we heading into an election, um, that my condo is a disaster because it's about to be painted. So um uh, anyways, I'm unfortunately I'm unfortunately back, but I am looking forward to the election, and I think it's going to end up being on the Sunday because I I do not see why the Liberals would want to have a, a, a thirty more than thirty six days as we've talked about thirty six days, not one minute longer. If I were uh, if I were them, and I think if I were them, I'd be regretting not calling it last week or the week before or a month ago. Man, testify. Yeah, can you think of why they haven't, Jenny? Can you think of why they haven't? Well, they obviously want to get some announcements out the door. They continue, they're continuing doing the child care announcements they, uh, with, the, with the provinces. They did Quebec last week. There's, uh, there's like a ton of rumors. They've signed one with an Ontario and, and they're going to announce, uh, they're going to announce uh, this week sometime. So um, I think they wanted to get some last minute uh, government announcements, uh, government announcements out the door. I don't think they should have, but I think that's what they were thinking. Do you think, uh, do, right. you, do you guys think, because this is a, a kind of according to Hoyle, add water and stir sort of formula that governments have used forever. So, you know, use the power of government in that short ramp up period to the campaign, do a ton of local announcements, you know, demonstrate that you're not just campaigning on things, but that you've done things. I mean, I'm the guy that was urging them to get those childcare deals done because I thought they had that fallow period after the budget. But do you think this stuff accretes value? For the rip period? Because I don't. No, I don't think so. Well, listening to listening to the New Democrats on my panel this week, I um, uh, which will be out tomorrow on the Hurley Burley, um, made me think a little bit differently about this. I mean, their critique of the government is so centered on you can't trust liberals. You can't trust liberals to do what they say. And they promised, like they're still saying they've promised child care. They're still using that line that they've promised child care for 30 years and never delivered it. And it made me think that maybe the liberals were wanting to sign up the whole country on child care just to defeat that argument, just so that that was not even a plausible thing to say. No, but to be fair to the NDP, you guys have signed deals with provinces before and it's never gone forward. I just don't think people care. Because you killed them. Because yes. you, because it's of like you. Saying Professor Plum is not around. because of me, because right. of you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Professor Plum, that bum, he's never teaching. It's because you guys strangled him in the library. <laughs> Fuck. In fairness, uh, I, I haven't. I, <laughs> I haven't heard I haven't heard the conversation with the NDP, but the only the only thing I would say 
uh, about that is I, I think it's, it may be really nose to the window pane, uh, too close to it. The other thing is that from my perspective, like I don't know how much of an antidote actually the uh, child care deals provide to that because the NDP will say that they're not done. It's not like people actually are walking into a child care space, so they're not going to see the physical examination uh, presence of it. So, you know, the government will be able to say, no, we've signed, you know, actual real deals with multiple provinces. I'm not sure they're still going to have an argument over whether that's real or it's not. I mean, I suppose that the NDP want to have that argument. But I, the fundamental critique isn't situational. It's not analytical. Like if that's the critique, that's always the NDP critique of the NDP. So of uh, the liberals, I should say. That's always the NDP bash on the liberals, which, ah, you can't trust them. And like, I don't know. Is that is that effective in this moment? Or if something is your eternal talking point, I just I just question whether it has you know, real uh, sandpaper value in the, in, 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 in the current circumstance. I'm not sure they're going to get very far in that argument. I think they're going to they're gonna win seats away from the Liberals by being better and more attractive than the Liberals, and by the Liberals, most importantly, not being good. They have to count on the Liberals not being good, being lazy, looking smug, drifting into a campaign, and taking punches on the job without putting their hands up. That's what they have to count on. I don't think it's going to be that people are going to go, you know what, I've decided I don't trust these Liberals. They say one thing, and then they don't deliver. I don't think that's going anywhere. That's just an eternal talk talking point for the NDP. Well, and it was it was interesting. Yesterday, uh, Singh was out and he was actually talking about uh, debt and spending. Uh, he was he was talking about uh, the fact that the, how are they how are how are the liberals going to pay for all the programs that uh, that they have uh, uh, instituted during COVID? He wasn't calling for an end to the programs. He was calling for an extension to to wage uh, subsidies to employment subsidies. But he was actually talking about uh, about de- debt and spending. So it's very interesting. Uh, it's, it's, he, he actually was actually more strong on the issue than what we've seen O'Toole be. So it's, it's very interesting what their numbers are, what their numbers are saying in terms of, uh, uh, of what the, where the issue set and where uh, voters' minds are. I wonder if they were using that, Jenny, to set up their argument for a uh, wealth tax and actually position themselves interestingly, perhaps as more fiscally responsible than the Liberals because they're prepared to raise taxes. In order to pay for, in order to offset some of this uh, spending, and try to get their wealth tax into play in the election, very popular idea. Not going to raise a lot of money in Canada, but a very popular idea. Yeah, it's possible. Could interfere with your pan, uh, plans for renovation of the condo there, Jenny. Could uh, <laughs> could, <laughs> could raid your could raid your pocketbook. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but you know, I, I I also wonder whether they may just be seeing the same polling that everyone else is seeing, which is that people have this kind of latent anxiety about the level of spending. They 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 think it's unsustainable, but in the but but that coexists in the minds of many people in the public with perhaps an even more present concern about ensuring that those p- programs are uh, extended and that we don't. Uh, leave ourselves short. And I like, I don't know that it needs to set something up. Like it may be that they're just going, I'm going to connect with you by saying three things that you agree with, but not every single one of them then like actually manifests itself in a logical outcome. Like I, you know, I, I think it's entirely possible in today's day and age to say, you know, the liberals, uh, you know, aren't delivering on this. They're not, we can't count on them uh, to extend these wage subsidies. As soon as the election's over, they're going to be gone and we're going to be in big trouble. And, you know, and they're spending, uh, in an unsustainable way uh, on things that don't matter. And, and and I, like, columnists will point out that not all those things square. The liberals will try to rebut that, but I, I don't know. Like, I, I just think they get people's heads nodding, right? So uh, I'm not sure Jenny, that they are setting something up. Can I draw on your expertise in, in uh, voter turnout? Sure. Um, not you. <laughs> Sorry. And, and uh, banjo playing. These are my two foremost areas of expertise. So the NDP have tremendous potential among young voters under 35, but particularly under 25. Like Singh's numbers are really quite astonishing in that group of people. They are notoriously difficult to get out to vote. I said to the New Democrats I was talking to that in a normal election, uh, one supporter uh, over the age of 55 is worth two supporters under the age of 55, under the age of 35. Um, and so are there tactics these days 
uh, given the way people do voter contact now and the way people get out the vote now, are there more effective ways at, at delivering that youth vote to the polls than used to be the case? Well, there's a lot of, you're seeing that the, the NDP are trying to do that al already. You've got, you've seen tremendous ar articles about it sings tremendous success on on the TikTok plat platform and other uh, social media platforms. So I think that is that's going to be something you're going to see the NDP continue to do uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, identifying and, and getting votes out there. Whether it actually works for them is going to end up being uh, whether it's going to be an end up going to be another story because we've seen even with the uh, even with the American election eight months ago, um, you know the Democrats. You know, David, we've talked about it on the show. They still were basically like, we have to get to the doors to identify votes and drag people out. There's, that's still ultimately the most effective form of um, of uh, GOTV, and so that's going to be the, the problem for the uh, for the NDP if 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 the voter levels of the 18 to 35s, 18 to 30s stays at the same level that uh, that it has in the past, is people just don't uh, come out in the same numbers. Uh, to your point, and so um, th that is going to be a very interesting dynamic to see to see what they do. But I think there's different tactics they can do. So many people now only get their their news and information from from their phones. I can't remember the last time I picked up a newspaper and and read it my uh, read it myself. So I think that they're going to employ those that they're going to employ those tactics. But I still think at the end of the day, the best way to get people out is the face to face contact or uh, secondary phones. Uh, there, there just hasn't been, we've seen it with the American election and they are so much higher than where any of our parties are in terms of tactics. It still is, became the bread and butter for them. That makes Do sense. you expect to find people knocking on your door this election? Do I expect? Yeah. Well, Will people door knock in this election? People are out door knocking now. Of course they're going to door knock. I think they okay. will. I think we have to see uh -huh. how. Th this is one of the factors that I think might shift during the campaign. Like if the Delta starts to really take off, I think it alters the tra uh, the trajectory of this campaign in 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 not entirely predictable ways. Um, you know, and there's some broader issues that we talk about there. But I think one of them on this specific is does that does that mean that one of the parties uh, around Labor Day, we'll say, for example, if, if cases are skyrocketing, certainly if uh, pediatric ICUs are starting to get filled up, if people go, whoa, 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 okay, so I'm going to, do one of the parties go, well, we're going to actually down tools on that. And will then other parties feel like it? So I think there's some interesting, I say interesting, it's, you know, concerning, but I think there's some, I, I think there's some question marks around this campaign because of the way the calendar is going to fall with the Delta being so unpredictable. But they, so to so go back to the right. American election, what, 161 million people voted, and that was at the height of the second, the second wave. That was in November when, you know, the, that, just before, you know, we were all locked down again uh, here in Ontario. And, you know, they, there was regular campaigning. Biden didn't have rallies, but his people were still out knocking on, on, on doors. The, the Republicans were having rallies and knocking on doors. The difference now is the vast, the so many people are vaccinated, 70 what is it? Seventy percent here in in Ontario, um, sixty percent of people are fully vaccinated. Seventy, close to eighty percent have one dose. I, I could be wrong on that, but it's a it's an astronomical number. So I just don't see. Uh, I think it would be a mistake for any party to come out and say we're not going to uh, door knock or we're going to scale back our campaign uh, based on on uh, what we've seen in the past, the American election, and by. Um, you know, this time uh, next week, we're going to have had five provincial elections that have happened in the country as well. It's it's kind of like, you know, Dina Hinshaw, the new chief medical officer of Ontario, came out yesterday and said the same thing. Um, they're not seeing more lockdowns because as the politicians and as they have said, uh, COVID's not going away. It's never going to be COVID, COVID zero. It just like the flu is never going away. So this is us learning how to live with with this. And that includes having an election. Yeah. One of the things, though, I presume as we get close to the start of school, that parents are going to be in a state of very high anxiety about their kids yep. um, and uh, and their kids' exposure. I mean, that's the that's the that's the big wild card here. And I just wonder how that, you know, whether that affects whether you want people coming to your door um, it, or it, whether it, you want it, strangers it, coming to your door or not. It will. I hear what Jenny's saying, but I think it's entirely circumstance dependent. I mean, we can look at what happened in November in the United States, but I think if in September in Canada and in places like Ontario, in particular in BC, if we see cases rise, if we start seeing kids 
the number of kids uh, with uh, COVID rising, I think you're going to see um, like a, just an unpredictable react. I just think it's going to get it's going to get weird, and the parties are going to have to improvise and figure out how to navigate that, balancing the need to get the job done with the need to demonstrate sensitivity to to public health, and it's going to be it's going to be an interesting uh, piece of alchemy. Can I just say, I'm so going to go back liberals. to the youth vote. Can I go back to the youth vote thing for right. one second? Because I got a question for you You can guys. do whatever you want, Scott. Excellent. It's, it's our show. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Excellent. Well, all right. I'll, I assume there's some, <laughs> I assume there's some uh, Will Amos inspired limitations on that uh, invitation. But uh, <laughs> I just, has the, you guys are talking about the youth vote and your question to Jenny and Jenny's answer was all about how do you drag them out, which I get. But in terms of motivating them, like to actually vote as opposed to say, oh, if I were inclined to vote, I would vote NDP disproportionately or whatever. Has there been an example in Canadian politics of a noticeable, like demonstrable uptick in youth voting other than legalizing weed? You, you know, and so I, I just I like, yeah, ha, you know, like. To motivate them to say, well, I have to go to the ballot box to get this thing that I care about. And I, it was even then it wasn't a huge number, but it appeared to be some measurable impact. And has there ever been another example? And so what would it possibly be in this campaign that would that would motivate? Like, I'm trying to think of my 23-year-old and my 19-year-old. Like, other than their old man bugging them, saying it's their civic duty, I don't know what would make them vote uh, based on what's on offer. I just don't think... Like Jack would vote to legalize weed. Will would campaign to legalize weed if that were in play now. But I don't know what else would, would get them out of bed. I think there was more at play in 2015 than just weed. I hear you, but I think there was more at play in 2015 than just weed. I think that Trudeau had genuine celebrity status among that age cohort, and they turned out. And and I, I think that they turned out for Obama in 2008 too. They will okay. turn out generally for celebrities, or people that have some very cult strong cultural cachet, as as Obama did, um, and only for non incumbents, only for challengers, because right. as soon as you govern, they didn't turn out for Obama in 2012, and they didn't come back for Trudeau in 2019. As soon as you govern, you're too compromised to purely motivate that group of people. But I will say this about Singh: it's not just that young people prefer the NDP to the other parties. In fact, there's a little bit less of that than there is about absolute favorability numbers for um, Singh in that cohort. So it's it's not just that they prefer him to the other parties. There's actual enthusiasm about him. But David, don't, don't NDP leaders always have high level of favorabilities? It doesn't necessarily translate into votes on any of the uh, on any of the uh, age groups. No, he's an interesting pattern, though. He's unusually strong has unusually high favorables for an NDP leader, for anybody, among the 18 to 35. And he has unusually low favorables among over 55, even for an NDP leader. So there's a very strong generational difference in the way people react to him. The, uh, the people on the panel suggested that some of that was racism among older Canadians, and I don't have no doubt that that exists and that that's a factor. But I also think that there's a difference in the way his communication is perceived, and I put this to them, that young people see his communication as direct, authentic, and cutting through the bullshit of politics, and that older people see his communication as light, lacking gravitas, and insubstantive. It's possible. We're spending a lot of, I, 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 uh, we're spending a lot of time talking about the NDP when really that they're, they're, you know, their increase, as everyone's talking about in the polls, is so insignificant. It could be seen as uh, as like margin of error based on uh, what the last election's results are outside of the right. uh, millennial uh, or the uh, Generation Z um, uh, cohort. True enough. It's just one of the right, things but they may, as other commentators have been suggesting, they, they may have more to say about whether the liberals win a majority than O'Toole does, though. Yeah. That's it's possible, but they're only they're only about if you look at so, the latest polls, they're only anywhere between three and four percent higher nationally uh, than uh, what they were in the last campaign, and there's been really been no significant uptick in Ontario. 
Right. Where they are in BC is essentially where they, they were there. I think they're up in the last nanos pool that I saw. They're only up 2% in British Columbia from where they were in the last election. So they're not significantly higher in any of the pools that we're, uh, any of the pools that we're seeing. That, 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 who is okay. significantly higher are the Liberals. They are significantly higher almost everywhere, minus, minus Ontario. They're a bit down in Ontario, um, but everywhere else they're, they're up. Like in BC, if you look at the latest, the numbers, they're 9% higher than what they got in the 2019 campaign. Uh, for sure. But if you're like me and you sit on the back porch and just rock back and forth and think of all the things that could go wrong, they're one of the four or five things that liberals had to be alarmed about that could get in the way of their majority. Um, I don't think they're the most important thing, but I think they're, um, I, I, I think you got to think now, I think you're obligated if you're running the liberal campaign to think now about what happens if that momentum increases during the writ, particularly in the first couple weeks and they start to sort of look like they're getting a little bit of a, um, a bounce, how do you blunt an NDP bounce? I think that's an interesting question and a scenario that the Liberals have to, have to contemplate. Well, because I think the Liberals have to assume that the Conservatives are going to rebound. I think, the, sure. I think that the, if I was running the Liberal campaign, I would be assuming that the Conservatives are going to regress, at least to the mean, and that we're going to see... Uh, Conservative numbers, 30 to 31, 32 percent. And so how do you win a majority against those numbers is what you need to be thinking about, not how do you win a majority against 25 percent, because they're not going to get 25 percent of the vote. They're going to get over 30 percent of the vote, I think. And okay, is this crazy? So, is this crazy? Arguably, you need that to happen. You need in the first 10 days of the campaign, the conservatives to start to be creeping up so that the story, the media story is, oh, in these early first couple of weeks, it looks like the... The conservatives are outperforming expectations. You need that if you're the liberals in order to say, all right, all you soft liberal NDP switchers, we're back to the traditional dynamic. And if you don't want Prime Minister O'Toole, then fucking get in line. Uh, like they, they need that dynamic. What I call disciplining the progressive vote. Yes. Yeah. Um, Jenny's less so convinced of O'Toole's ability to haul the campaign onto his back and fighter pilot well, his way I'm, through the public. Uh, maybe, but I, I think I, I think he is a potential wild card in this campaign because he's got to be at the bottom of his estimation levels right now. He's got to be, uh, however good or bad he is, he's almost got to be underestimated at this point. And I think there's a reasonable prospect that he outperforms those expectations um, in the campaign. Um and I think the conservative campaign could outperform expectations in the campaign, in part because everything is set so low right now. Yeah, well, okay. I guess we'll see. Well, we're going to be this time next week. We'll be we'll be into it. So we'll see. We'll see kind of how they uh, how the, they uh, they take off. As as we have said, campaigns matter. And uh, there were a lot of people that said that our floor was uh, was 30 percent. And uh, we've seen with most of the national polls in the last month that that's not the case. So. Um, to your point, uh, to your point, David, there's only one one r way for uh, for uh, the, the campaign to go, and that is uh, hopefully up. So I don't like his approach to the campaign, O'Toole, right now. I don't like this pre-positioning of Trudeau shouldn't be calling an election um, because of COVID. Um, and it's an inappropriate time to call an election. First of all, it's in direct conflict with the messaging of some provincial governments in the country about what the situation is is with respect to COVID. But more importantly, I think by this point, I, I know that what they're trying to do is they're trying to set up a week where you're skirmishing around the legitimacy of the election and whether the Liberals are craven opportunists or not. I think that happens for a couple of days regardless. But all of this pre-election communication about you shouldn't have one, aren't you missing an opportunity to be articulating why the government should be changed as opposed to effectively taking the position that the government shouldn't change, that the circumstances in the country make it all for the best that we continue to have a liberal government. I just find that such a weak positioning for the official opposition to come into with, and I don't understand why they're not publicly chomping at the bit to replace this government with a better one. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I, I think that it makes uh, it makes the campaign seem scared uh, to go into an election. It doesn't instill a lot of confidence. And it's also a, a message that a vast majority of people that are conservative voters and supporters uh, fundamentally disagree with. 
presumably conservative voters are the, are, are the cohort that actually most won an election because they would be the people that would most want to see the, the government replaced. Um, I, you also don't need to do it. If, like, if you think there's any milk in it's the wrong time for an election, this demonstrates that their values aren't what they say in terms of Trudeau and the liberals, when you know the NDP are hitting that. So you don't need to hit that if you're O'Toole. Like if there's, if, I mean, all you can get out of that is that it takes a shade off of the liberals. And if it's going to work, then the, the NDP are uncorking that. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then you've wasted time, as you say, demonstrating the superiority of your alternative. I, I, it takes me to, to something I feel strongly, which is it takes me to the liberals. And, and, and I think... I mean, launch day is always such a big deal, right? Like, you know, you, you, it is, I, I joke, like, it's like New Year's Eve for political hacks, right? You know, like you spend all your time going, oh, New Year's Eve is going to be the greatest. We're going to like work on, we're going to have a party. I'm going to be wearing this. It's going to be great. And at, at midnight, the horns are going to go and I'm going to kiss the most beautiful woman and all this kind of shit, right? And it's always a letdown. And launch day is kind of like that, right? Like, you know, you put all this energy in it. But I Especially think that last part. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, nobody kisses me. I'm off. I'm off in the corner kissing videotapes. But I, I really think the liberals, I think they have an opportunity to make um, launch day a brand new message about why this can, because I don't like their positioning. Uh, coming into this campaign. I mean, there's hidden this faux bullshit that probably doesn't count against them. It doesn't matter about how parliament isn't working. It's either people aren't paying attention to it or people are and they com- they identify it as p- obviously contrived. It doesn't doesn't get you anywhere, in my view. And I, I just think, um, like, if I really... They want- don't have an example of one thing they wanted to do that they couldn't do. It's So it's all... it's. And you can convince yourself, well, it's all bullshit, but nobody, it doesn't matter. And you set it up, whatever. Like, I don't understand. First of all, I'm in complete agreement. And we've said this many times. I like, I think they should have called this damn thing three, four weeks ago. Um, But in addition to that, I think on launch day, like, I think it falls on the liberals. If they really want to set the pace, they got to say, look, here, we need a mandate. We actually, I, there's some, a couple of really important decisions. And I would take control of the Delta question mark in this campaign. And I would put right on the table on day one and say, the question of um, mandatory requirements and vaccination and vaccination passports at the federal level, at the provincial level, th- this is a divisive question. And it and and people have different views on this and they argue them with passion. And it's sufficiently important as we go forward, if we have to live with COVID uh, ad infinitum, it's sufficiently forward that I want a majority mandate behind me to say, this is what my vote is. This is where I'm going. So I want to, so I would take control of that issue. And we know that that's a wedge in particular uh, for a tool that would cause them trouble. And then I would obviously extend it to, and as we build an economic recovery, we got to get the right program. What is that right program? As opposed to just drifting in the campaign saying, we put together a budget and it highlighted these values and we're going to continue. And all that soft kind of just backing into a campaign. Like, I think there's a, you know, I don't think it's about calling the election now and people saying it's unnecessary. I think they can they can quash all of that if they come out with a sharp reason that they, like, I want a mandate. I, Justin Trudeau, want a mandate to do these two things. Give it to me if you agree with me. Don't if you don't. Um, and I, I, I get, I will see if they do that. But my feeling is they're just, They've got, they're going to stick with this kind of, you know, rice pudding without raisins kind of message. And I think they got to fix it. But it seems to be working for them. Well, we'll see. I mean, nobody's engaged, right? So, like, I think they're going to find that there's going to be an immediate correction in the polls. And then they'll battle back and they'll win. And they'll win a large minority or a majority. But I think that if they go in with that soft message, and if, as David says, it's it's inevitable that there's got to be a little momentum uh, for the cellar dwelling O'Toole's of the world, then uh, then you're gonna you're gonna start off with ten days of reverse momentum. I would try to fix that by saying, no, here's the sharp end of this stick and why we're having this campaign and what I want out of it. Um, so I'm looking for that, and I really would put I would put the the question of COVID and the resurgent Delta variant right on the table up front and go, I'm not doing this two weeks from now when cases are rising. I'm doing it right now and saying it's part of my rationale for calling this election. 
Well, they can also point to vaccines as the high, the high rate of vaccines uh, in terms of uh, if they want to actually address the Delta. It, they can say the reason that Canada's not getting hit, cases, cases may be rising, but people aren't being hospitalized in the, the numbers uh, that they had been pre-vaccines because we were able to, albeit late, um, uh, we were able to get, ensure that Canadians had a high level of vaccination. So they can actually point to a win um, they can actually point to a win on on that, but the parliament is dysfunctional. That's that, those are Trudeau's words on that. The prepositioning on that three weeks ago was exactly could have been exactly the same as yep. uh, if you went back and listened to Stephen Harper, Harper yep. when we led into the two thousand and eight uh, into the two thousand and eight campaign. Uh, because like I remember that I actually went that summer. I went to Italy for a couple of weeks for a vacation, and the moment I land my my old BlackBerry, the big BlackBerry that had the, you know, like the size of an iPad with the ball yeah. on the side I and would it. stay charged for a good three and a half weeks each time you plugged it in. And I remember going to the PMO and they're like, OK, well, we've got to talk because the, the, you know, the boss has decided we're having a, we're, we're calling the election in like two and a half weeks. So it, it's it, it, it's the reason they're going now is ultimately because uh, it's not going to get any better for them. It's a, it was better for them. A month ago, but th they can do a vision, my vision versus their vision versus Aaron O'Toole versus Jagmeet Singh. But at the end of the day, they're having the election now because the, 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 the chances that both from a COVID point of view and more importantly, an economic point of view, things are going to get dicier for incumbent governments. That's why they're going now. And it didn't hurt you in 08. Okay, I'm going to put you, you on this. That. All, all I was going to say, David, is it didn't hurt you in 08. So I think liberals point to that example now. They point to that example and they say, see, this is happening. I just... I just think it's inefficient. It doesn't do like the campaign's not going to be about dysfunction parliament. Like it's so so to me it's just it's it's a waste of message space. Uh get to the thing that the campaign's going to be about and it has to be about if you're to succeed. Quit dicking around with this phony message. Yeah. Sorry, so David. Jenny, I, I got to put you on this I got I got to put you on the spot and oh, no. you, you're not you're not involved in this effort and I'm not going to make you accountable in any way for it. But I you do know that. Aaron Thanks, O'Toole. Pre <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You, you do know Aaron O'Toole pretty well. And what could he do? What is it possible from him or the party that would change the trajectory that we expect this campaign to follow? Well, Aaron's a smart, like, Aaron, there's no disputing that Aaron's a very smart, uh, he is a very smart guy. I think that the problem he has, the, the biggest problem he has, and we've talked about this, and, and I think you said the end, it touched you touched on with your conversation uh, with the NDP strategist, is authenticity. So it was he campaigned uh, to win a leadership race based on uh, someone that he was not. It, it was someone that that's not philosophically um, uh, who he was. And now, so what what people are seeing now is philosophically uh, and from a policy point of view, more who Aaron. Uh, Aaron is, and that's the challenge she is going to have with traditional conservative, um, with traditional conservative voters. The reason, you know, why we're, you know, anywhere between, you know, seven and and four points behind nationally where we were uh, in the last election. So I think that um, I, what he would need to do is, you know, forget the carbon tax. You you fucked up doing that. Ho hopefully, no one will bring it up because all the other parties minus Max. And Maverick uh, uh, support uh, support some form of uh, carbon tax, and uh, I look a little bit. Uh, you can you can look to the past successes, and you know, and still move uh, still move forward. And so, I think that opportunities he has, for example, like the debate, is going to be a very interesting one uh, to watch. He's he's a very comfortable uh, debater. Uh, he's he speaks uh, very well. So I think that's going to be the first opportunity for Canadians really to see. Um, Aaron, uh, you know, beside Trudeau, beside Singh and see what he can uh, offer. The caveat to that, like the, the, the downside for him is if the PPC stays, uh, what could be a downside is that if the PPC stays at the numbers nationally that they're at now, it is a very um, uh, likely uh, scenario that Max and Bernier is in, is in the debates and Bernier's opponent, Bern where who Bernier will go after in those debates will not be Trudeau, will not be Singh. He will be single- Singularly, singularly focused on uh, going after uh, going after O'Toole, in my opinion. Which will lead him. God, that's such an interesting point, Jenny. That's such an interesting point because that will lead him right into a strategic decision about whether he needs to win the fight with Bernier for those voters 
or whether he uses Bernier's attack as an opportunity to change his impression with other voters. Well, but I think he's, I think that, uh, you know, I was back home for, I was back home for close to a month uh, up until uh, two days ago. And I spoke with, uh, I spoke with a fair number of people, non-political people. And uh, uh, in the course of the conversation, it would cut, like I had people say, you know, I'm, I just, I'm going to vote for that French guy this time. I just, I, I'm not, I'm just going to not vote conservative this time. So Aaron's problem is going to be, yes, you need to appeal to, uh, uh, to swing voters, to the, you know, the, the, the unicorn of the voters, the 905 soccer moms and what have you. Uh, but you've also got to ensure that you uh, that you actually keep the people that uh, that have voted for you over the last, you know, several elections, even the ones that uh, that that you have lost. So they've they have a very large yeah. challenge going in uh, going into that. Um, uh, and that's that is going that's going to end up being the um, that is going to end up being, I think, a very interesting thing to watch during the course of the campaign. Can, can I add one possible further layer to that um which i don't think jenny you you necessarily agree with me about um the prospects of uh of how much the delta could become a factor in the campaign but i think people are anxious about it and i think they're going to likely grow more anxious and it becomes interesting if in an election bernier's got a bigger platform and is banging the drum and the delta starts rising and cases are increasing and people are having debate about well like how how worried do we need to be about this what are the icus and all that and I, you have that discussion happening and then suddenly bernier uh is able to wedge o'toole because he can unapologetically argue to that small group of people that say "Fuck all this and that that actually further harms O'Toole's ability to consolidate the right vote. So he may be, you know, O'Toole's forced to say, look, everybody's got to get vaccinated. We got to be responsible with this. But O'Toole's been arguing about how it's an inappropriate time to have an election because we should be focused on public health. Then he's going to have Max arguing the other. And Max is going to find some traction there because there's more than 7% or 6% of the population that share his take on that. Now, that may not be a popular view among friends of mine, but he's got he's got more room there and that's gonna that that further runs a risk if that issue is prominent in the campaign it runs a risk of actually wedging o'toole so he's getting it from both ends and he's got no choice he's gonna have to say go fly a kite public health first but that gives bernier some room to eat up some of his vote on that other flank what would you do scott you've written the odd you've written the odd launch speech if you're writing o'toole's speech What's the most important thing you want to get across? Like, what's the punch you throw? I well, the first I'll tell you the first thing I wouldn't do is I I think that uh, conservatives consistently make the mistake of thinking that people hate Trudeau as much as they do, and I, I think by and large people have made it pretty clear they're reasonably comfortable with Trudeau. They're even comfortable with his insufficiencies. I mean, if blackface taught you nothing else, it taught you that um, that people have an enormous appetite for overlooking. Uh, blemishes that would uh, otherwise sink uh, a political leader when it comes to Trudeau. So I wouldn't do this hardcore Trudeau's fucked everything up and he's no good and all that kind of stuff. I, I would go, as we've talked about before, I would try my best to define the issue around uh, pocketbook uh, tax issues. I would try to talk about affordability issues. And I would say, look, we are the people that can best manage that. It seems to me that if some of the polling has been ambiguous about who people trust the most to handle the economy. There's been polling even that's shown that the Liberals were ahead on that. I don't think you can have success in a general election if you're a Conservative, if you don't at least reclaim that territory. So I would focus on, look, uh, we've, got to, we've got to figure out um, how we make this economy work at a lunch bucket level. And I think I would go hard on those affordability issues. And I wouldn't, by the way, be freaked out about having perfect remedies to everything. I think there's lots of room for an opposition leader right now to say, I'm going to be bringing forward, here's the kind of things I'm focusing on. But I would get the critique sank first. Get people nodding their heads and saying, yeah, you're fucking right. I am worried about the cost of things. And I am worried about whether or not my kid can uh, ever own a home. And I am worried about where things are headed and how we're going to finally reconcile all this i would hammer hard on that stuff that would that if you can do that what's on the day proof one point that trudeau doesn't what's the proof point either one of you what's the proof point that trudeau doesn't care about cost of living doesn't care about that what are you gonna how are you gonna pin this on trudeau well i think you're talking about the high level of debt that the the country has has assumed uh uh 
simply because, and now that we've talked about this, you've seen the price of lumber has skyrocketed. The price of certain foods have, have uh, sky, skyrocketed. Look at the price of meat. If you go in and, and, and buy steak or buy even a, a box of uh, burgers for the barbecue, it's, it's astronomically higher. You can't buy a box of uh, burgers that, that, are no, that are $15 now, um, which is so much higher than, than what it is. So what you're going, what you're going to go after Trudeau on is the fact that what is the plan uh, uh, to deal with Canada's uh, debt, uh, because right now it's affecting um, uh, cost of living through inflation, which eventually will go to uh, the the uh, the increase of interest rates, which could actually uh, make people uh, that are that are not going to be able to afford the homes they live in. If interest rates increase, if you're if you're a forty year old, uh, uh, you know you. Uh, a couple that lives in Oakville and they have a $1.5 million mortgage and interest rates go from, you know, the 1.5% that it's at now up to four or 5%, that could actually mean you can't make your, your payments. You can't make your mortgage payments. And so if I'm the conservative. Interest rates are so huge. Interest rates are so huge. When, 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 when Paul was in finance, the officials always used to talk about how there's no tax cut that you could give people that gives them the same kind of savings that a reduction in interest rates does. Like, there's just a massive impact on household budgets one way or another. So the prospect of interest rates rising should be something that's pretty concerning to people. Yes. And that's, that's where I would go. I'm not sure I agree that you need to really – I don't know that you need to link it as much to debt because I think there's some um, – there are some cul-de-sacs in that argument uh, that are going to get exposed pretty quickly. I think you want to breeze by all that stuff as proof points. You get heads nodding. But I think ultimately you got to say, look, we're, your proof point, David, is uh, you've answered it, I think. you got to say, look, um, these guys are taking us down a path that will result in higher interest rates. You've even got... Uh, the government and the Bank of Canada saying they're going to tolerate higher interest rates. So that's going to happen. So that's going to happen and everything's going to be more expensive and there's no plan to manage that. And the reason we've had 15, 20 years of like relative success economically is because interest rates have been low and we need to keep them there and we need to manage that. And I, I think I would just try to hammer away on that. And that and the, the example I would use wouldn't be debt. I keep going back to housing. I keep going back to the, you can't rent at an affordable rate you can't buy. There's no prospect that your kid will ever be able to die. You're not going to be able to leave your kid an inheritance. You've got to give your money to your kid before you die so that they can buy a home. And the dream of home ownership is dying. I would hammer on that. And I know there are weaknesses to that argument. Economists and others will come and say, well, this is why that's not true. But that's a trap for the liberals. So they get caught into a technocratic argument over those things, a big trap. Because then there's nothing that makes them sound more like what conservatives accuse them of, which is uh, removed elitist uh, who want to argue as though it's an economics TED talk. And so I would hammer away on those things. I'd be like the threat of interest rates rising and the inaccessibility of the number one anchor of your financial security forever, your home. You can't get that now if you're... But, uh, if you're so anybody that isn't already that in home one. ownership is hard is because of basically all of the red tape and uh, red tape there is around actually uh, building more homes. It's 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 municipal governments. It's nimbyism. It's all of that kind of stuff. So I could I think that's a fantastic message, but I still think there's something to the debt. There is a reason Jugmeet Singh, the NDP leader, was talking about the debt yesterday. I've spoken to candidates who have been door knocking, and it's coming up at the doors. So yeah. I, I wouldn't ignore the debt because obviously people people are people are aware of it and they're worried about it. So, so uh, uh, it's not just home ownership. There is, there is a reason why it's, it's coming up. So I think that it would be irresponsible for the Tories not to talk about, uh, uh, you know, the tr $1 trillion net debt that the country has. Sorry. And I just, I, I do want to respond to that because I, I agree with you and I want to be precise. I would put that into my rat-a-tat-tat -tat set of talking points about things that are fucked up and the reasons that you need to get a new government. I just would be, anxious about really banking on that for fear that people will hear that you're going to become a deficit hawk, which is I don't think where people are at. And secondly, you got to be careful. You want to push people toward the argument that you think you have the best potential policy remedy for that you can get through in a, in a debate and a discussion at the doors. And I don't think it's easy to have a good answer on the debt. So I, but I think that home ownership, you can jerk together a policy on home ownership that, you know, might be bullshit, but probably gets you through a conversation. A third of Canadians think the debt is the most important challenge facing the country. A third of Canadians don't care how big the debt is. 
And about a third of Canadians are at a point where they think it's a serious challenge. They're not prepared to contemplate significant cuts in government spending yet to deal with it, but they wouldn't want to hear a government, a potential government, sounding cavalier or disinterested in managing the debt. I think that's roughly how it plays in political terms. Um, so I'm interested in something, you two. Since we last met, which was sadly two weeks ago, I really missed you last week, but I needed a break. Um, but since we last you met, needed a break from, a from, from, from us, from us, you need a break from us. <laughs> I did. Jesus Christ, that Jenny Burns just fucking on and on. <laughs> yeah, she is the problem. She is the problem. Um, for sure, well, Scott, no doubt. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a breath of fresh air anytime. So, what is your shirt today, by the way? Anyway. Dusty Springfield, Dusty in Memphis. I can't, I can't tell. Dusty in Memphis, son oh. of a preacher, man. Um, fantastic. You don't have so, to say you love me. Just be close at hand. <clears throat> okay. Uh, that was sweet. Really. You asked. You asked. Okay. I'm off my, I'm off my game now. What was I saying? I was saying that since we last met. The Trudeau government went out to New Brun New Newfoundland and Labrador and cut them a multi-billion dollar check to cover off the cost of a terrible policy error that the government of Newfoundland had made with regard to Muskrat Falls. Then it went off to Quebec and signed a multi-billion dollar deal for effectively nothing. Um because it was for child care, but Quebec already has a child care program, so it's not going into child care, it's going into whatever Legault wants it to go into, and he's made it pretty clear that that's the case. I'm not saying these things are bad things to do. In fact, an asymmetric health deal is something that Paul Martin did, so I'm not saying necessarily that it's a bad thing to do. But these things, these kinds of things used to be controversial. First of all, we're talking about real money here. It's like $6 billion in the case of Quebec and about $5 billion in the case of Newfoundland. People in Canada used to fight over these amounts of money. Um, and the second thing is the principle behind each of them is odd, especially the case in Newfoundland. Uh, and I would imagine that there are other jurisdictions that might say, well, we made a policy error. Jason Kenney could say, well, I kind of regret not investing in, I kind of regret investing in Keystone. Can you give me a billion and a half dollars to compensate Alberta for the fact that I put that money into Keystone. I mean, it's a weird principle and it's a lot of money and nobody seemingly gave a shit. Well, that's because there's also no opposition. Like there's, we, we haven't heard any of the uh, parties actually come out and, and do any messaging on it. Jay, Kenny came out after the Quebec deal and basically said, okay, well, we want to be able to do whatever the fuck we want. We want to do with our money, uh, the health or the childcare money, um, the same as Lego. Like what's good for them is good for us, and so that's the only opposition to any of the of the uh, uh, any of the policies that you just mentioned. It was it's part of the reason why no one knows about it or there's no controversy is there's no opposition to it. There's no one standing up and saying uh, this seems like a fucking like lunacy that what you're what you're doing and and you know Canadian taxpayers are going to you know pay for the mistakes of past governments of Newfoundland and Labrador. There's no, there's no opposition to this because for whatever reason, everyone's trying to the go along to get along. They don't want to offend anyone uh, leading, into the, uh, leading into the election. And so that's why I think that it's not controversial is because everyone's just sh shrugging and saying, ah, let's just go with it. But if you wanted to make the point that Trudeau doesn't know the value of money, I mean, surely you would be harping a little bit on the fact that he just traipses around the country throwing billions at things. Of course, of course you would. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure that's, I mean, if we're going to talk crass politics, I'm not sure that's the best, um, that's that's the best attack. I think I would go a little bit to where Ginny was hinting at about um, uh, regional favoritism, try to get the fairness argument going and saying, wait a second, right? Um, you know, I'm all, I'm, I'm all for helping out Newfoundland, but how can it be that the government set aside $17 billion for energy transition, and yet Alberta has hardly seen a penny of that yet. And, you know, if you want to talk about climate change, don't we need to talk about the energy transition that's necessary? And doesn't that need to be treated as a national priority, at least as much as Muskrat Falls, for Christ's sake? Um, I'm puzzled, frankly, that when you look at a bunch of the things that government has used, the giant checkbook and the tolerance for debt in these last few months to deal with, um, I'm puzzled that they haven't 
uh, expended more of that money to try to blunt themselves, not to win seats in Alberta. I mean, that would be nice, but just to blunt themselves against those kinds of arguments. So I don't think a bunch of that money has been uh, been deployed. And I think that it could have, I think there are legitimate policy reasons to do that. I think there's really compelling political arguments. Uh, the last thing I want to say about this is I just want to take a, a, a one pause of a moment to remind everybody that the reason it was necessary to bail out Newfoundland is because Danny Williams is the worst fucking premier that's ever existed <laughs> in any province at all time. He's a shit person, a shit politician. And he was awful, awful, awful. And we're not editing this out, Jill. I want to keep it. I don't like the guy. I've never liked the guy. <laughs> I've been proven right. Time and history have demonstrated that my take on Danny Williams is correct. He's no goddamn good. And there will always be a giant stain over his name in the books of history. And to that, I agree with Scott. 100% united. Curse of politics, hurly-burly panel, united. So let's take that segue and go right into our hey yous. And Scott, do you want to go wait first? Wait a second. Oh. Wait a second. Oh. We have a transition to the hey you. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. Go ahead, Scott. Give us a hear, hey you. Uh, I'm gonna. I, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go back to what I said a few minutes ago. My hey yous to the prime minister. I think they're gonna call the election on Sunday. I think he's gonna wander up to the microphone, you know, and and say, "All right, we're having an election." And my great fear is that he's going to repeat the sort of broad, values based big sort of picture message that he's been using for months and months and months. That has served them well. So to be fair, I think it needs to be sharper. So my hey you to the prime minister is get into it. Get into it on day one. Dictate the terms of the debate. Dictate the terms of the election. In particular, take control of this Delta variant question mark that's going to hang over the campaign now because of the timing, because we didn't get this election called in July, and say that it's part of your campaign. Say that you want to move with a national mandate. Say that you want to have Canadians vote on that. And that will inoculate you against the issue of whether you have uh, taken this thing too lightly and that public health isn't as big a priority for you as politics. It inoculates you on that. And I think it kicks over a hornet's nest into O'Toole's political coalition. So go hard, go precise. And I would uncork that issue right away. Don't wait till Labor Day when cases are rising. Do it now. Well, I got to go next, Jenny, because I'm just going to echo. I got to go next. I got to go next because I'm just going to echo Scott. Scott took mine, which is I'm just going to phrase it a little bit differently to the people running the liberal campaign. And I know that they've been sitting on the edge of their chairs waiting for my advice, Katie in particular. <laughs> and what and, and here it comes. Here it comes. Win the first week. Win the first fucking week. Make sure you win the first week week. I, I, I've done incumbent campaigns and I've had a bad first week plan and I've had a good first week plan and I know the difference now and it really matters. Come into this election with energy and purpose in the first week to set the terms of the election campaign um, or this thing could get away from you and start to be about something altogether different than what you want it to be about. Jenny. Well, mine's kind of a bit different. My hey you is actually to Jay Hill and the Maverick Party. Uh, they had their founding convention uh, much later than I actually assumed they already had it uh, this past weekend, uh, where they came out and said that they are not going to run candidates in any ridings out West that could split the vote uh, and ensure the NDP or the Liberals would win, which is very good. I'm very happy to hear. As a Conservative, I am very happy to hear this. But this is a protest party that's now refusing to pro do any form of protest. It just seems <laughs> a bit strange to me. <laughs> We're an applause party. <laughs> so, so as happy as I am about this to hear this, uh, that, it, that that it, it you know it, it it means that it's not going to affect the outcome of my friends that are that are running out west of, uh, for the Conservative Party. My hey you is to Jay Hill and Maverick. Like, why the fuck do you even exist then? It's a pretty good question. Excellent. It's a very 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 good question. <laughs> uh, I, in this particular case, I don't want hey you to end the show. I got to ask you folks one more question. So I read Obama's uh, I, I read Obama's autobiography, and so I know that in two thousand and four, when he was a, a, essentially a failed local Chicago politician, um, he um, attracted into his orbit a guy named David Asselrod, 
who was one of the leading political consultants in the United States and had a big reputation of his own. And David Axelrod threw himself into the Barack Obama campaign, culminating in the nomination victory and then in the election victory and then went into, um, went into the White House as his senior advisor. This past weekend, Barack Obama had a birthday party to celebrate his 60th birthday. And because they were getting shit about holding a big party during COVID, they scaled back the guest list. And Jay-Z and Beyonce, who I don't think were at the meetings in 2004, kept their invitation to the uh, party, and David Axelrod got dropped. What's the story about politics that comes from this? That's, it's the life, it's the life, hacks like us, uh, it's the life as, 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 you know, Michael Corleone and, and uh, Jerry Butt said to me once, uh, this is the life we choose. That is the, that is the, there is, uh, it's the, it's, it's kind of what politics, what have you done for me lately? And, and Barack Obama does not need David Axelrod for anything, but he sure as hell likes to hang out with Jay-Z and Beyonce and, you know, uh, John Legend and all of those, uh, all of the, the celebrities. Absolutely. Like, welcome to the reality of life. We are functions, not friends, right? We serve a function. Help us get elected, manage through. If that all goes well, everybody's happy. Um, but uh, don't think for one moment uh, that if I attain a level of standing that I can hang out with Paul McCartney, that I will be choosing to hang out with you instead. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's not happening. <laughs> So, so if you're surprised by that, and if you're injured by that, you need to go and take some time in the mirror and have an honest conversation with yourself. So, Well, since everybody has a Netflix subscription, I'm going to make an old, old, old movie recommendation. It's a movie called No Way Out. It is, as far as I'm aware, oh, Kevin yeah. Costner's first starring role, and it's a great Gene Hackman performance and even a great Sean Young performance. But every time I hear a story about somebody in politics like this Obama Axelrod one, I think about the relationship between Hackman as the senator and his chief of staff. And it's one of the interesting political sidebars of that movie. Uh, so there you go. Go watch No Way Out, and you'll realize why we're all such disposable toilet brushes here in politics. Um, I love No Way Out. Uh, love No Way Out. Thank you. The first episode of Curse of Politics. Aren't you looking forward to the writ every goddamn day? Every goddamn day. What could us. be better? All of us, ah, all the time. I know. Hmm. All right. Thank you all for listening and watching. Carpeting. Subscribe. Subscribe to Curse. Subscribe to Curse of Politics on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever else you do this on YouTube. And uh, thank you to everybody at Air Quotes for getting this new show up and running. And a special thank you to Gordon Pinson. See you next week.